Coming up, accusations of major misconduct for Manzanero. Plus, my two cents on the municipal elections. You're listening to Brent's Two Cents, the semi-serious thoughts of a guy in Belize. And now here's the host of this podcast from somewhere in Belize City, Brent Toombs. Hey, welcome to the podcast for the week of March the 8th. Well, the PUP put a good old-fashioned ass-beating on the UDP last week in the municipal elections. I'll give you my two cents on the election results and what they mean for both major political parties a bit later. But first, I want to talk about the latest development in the war on Dr. Manzanero. Late Tuesday of last week, the CEO in the Ministry of Health and Wellness served the embattled Director of Health Services with a letter accusing Dr. Manzanero of major misconduct. It appears that CEO Daisy Mendez, or more likely her boss, Minister of Health and Wellness, Michelle Shabbat, didn't appreciate that Dr. Manzanero had the audacity to return to work after being placed on administrative leave for five days while he was being investigated for misconduct. So they decided to increase the pressure on Dr. Manza and try to further damage his reputation by accusing him of major misconduct. And that adjective is not something that should be taken lightly. To accuse an employee of misconduct is to say they made a mistake, that they made a bad decision when they probably should have known better. But to accuse someone of major misconduct is to indict them for a serious offense, something that resulted in damage to the organization or to the people served by the organization, and something that they should be fired for. So when the Ministry of Health and Wellness accuses Dr. Manzanero of major misconduct, they are accusing him of being so incompetent that he is no longer fit to be the Director of Health Services. And that is a long way from, "Eh, we just wanted to go in a new direction and place people where we think they can best be utilized. The situation with Dr. Manzanero has reached the point where the ministry is prepared to use the nuclear option. They are prepared to destroy the man if they must, just to get him to go away. So what exactly is Dr. Manzanero being accused of now? Well, the letter referenced three situations. First, that he never accepted an offer from the Belize Agriculture and Health Authority to use their lab facility to process tests. Now, that was in April of last year, and as I explained on last week's podcast, Belize only had recorded 18 cases of COVID-19 by late April, and by May 5th, all, except for the two people that had perished to that point, had recovered. So Belize was statistically COVID-free, and would remain that way for nearly another month. Plus, Any decision to use or not to use the Baja Lab would have been made by the National Oversight Committee. Sure, Dr. Manza would have advised if he thought using the Baja Lab at that time would have been beneficial or not. But the ultimate decision was made by the NOC, of which the current Prime Minister was the co-chair. The huge spike in infections and deaths would not come for another six months. So to pin all that on Dr. Manzanero for not convincing the NOC to use the Baja lab is simply ridiculous. But now there are new accusations being levied against Dr. Manzanero. First, that he declined to participate in the trial of four treatment options, including hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir. Known as the Solidarity Trial, which was organized globally by the World Health Organization, the study was facilitated here in the Caribbean through the University of the West Indies. Now, what the Ministry of Health and Wellness does not mention in their letter is that while over 100 countries expressed interest in participating in the Solidarity Trial, 
only 43 countries got approved for recruitment, of which only 30 countries actually conducted clinical trials. In the Caribbean, UWI would only facilitate trials in the countries where the university had clinical facilities, namely Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Barbados. So it's highly likely that even if Dr. Manzanero had wanted Belize to participate in the Solidarity Trial, Belize would not have been approved to do so. And here's the kicker. Of the four treatment options that were being tested, by July, the WHO had already submitted a midterm report saying that two of those treatments, including hydroxychloroquine, should be discontinued. And when the final report came out in October of 2020, the WHO said that none of the treatments, which included remdesivir, had any meaningful effect on the recovery of COVID-19 patients nor did any of the drugs do anything to prevent deaths from the virus. In fact, in November, the World Health Organization issued revised guidelines recommending that remdesivir not be used to treat patients hospitalized with COVID-19. But despite everything we now know, the Ministry of Health and Wellness is accusing Dr. Manzanero of major misconduct for not making 100 vials of remdesivir that were donated in October available to the public. Now, please, understand the timeline of these events. In October, the WHO releases a report that remdesivir does not do anything. And a few weeks later, the WHO revises its guidelines to recommend that remdesivir is not used at all. But somehow, Dr. Manzanero is guilty of major misconduct for doing exactly what the World Health Organization recommended? You see, that's why the Ministry of Health and Wellness is losing credibility with people like me. Whether it's remdesivir or ivermectin, it seems that the ministry puts more value on YouTube videos than it does on the World Health Organization. But there's more that you need to know about remdesivir. The drug was developed by an American pharmaceutical company called Gilead Sciences, initially to fight hepatitis C and later used as treatment for the Ebola virus. Gilead had conducted their own small-scale trials to see if remdesivir could help seriously ill COVID-19 patients. And like any good big pharma company, they produced some very glowing reports about their own product. You may remember that an ex-president liked to big up remdesivir when he wasn't trying to peddle hydroxychloroquine. And as of last spring, Gilead's PR was working well for them. In May of 2020, the European Commission entered into a procurement agreement to allow for the purchase of 500,000 treatments of remdesivir. Now, a procurement agreement just means that a member nation could purchase remdesivir if they wanted. It was not an obligation to purchase. But remdesivir is not cheap. A course of treatment requires 10 daily doses that cost $250 each. So that's $2,500 US per patient. And members of the European Union were prepared to buy enough of this wonder drug to treat half a million people. But along comes the World Health Organization with their most inconvenient solidarity trial involving 12,000 people in 30 countries that shows that remdesivir has no meaningful effect on seriously ill COVID-19 patients. And just like that, the drug maker sees potential sales in Europe worth over $2 billion, all but vanish. So what does Gilead do? Well, in October, they start donating remdesivir to any country that will take it. Because just like the completely unscientific accounts of ivermectin in Peru and Brazil, Gilead knows that if they can get anyone to claim that remdesivir was saving lives, they might be able to save a few sales. But not Belize. 
Because our director of health services at the time, Dr. Marvin Manzanero, was not going to go against the advice of the WHO and let Belizeans be used as human lab rats in order to help a $60 billion pharmaceutical company make a few more sales during this global pandemic. Dr. Manzanero stood up to Big Pharma and stood by the WHO. But no sooner was he hospitalized with COVID-19 himself then the new regime at the Ministry of Health and Wellness went ahead and added remdesivir to the list of approved protocols. A drug that the WHO still advises should not be given to patients and is so prohibitively expensive that there is no way Belize can even afford to purchase it for use in our public health system. But hey, at least Gilead Sciences can now include Belize on the list of countries that have agreed in policy at least, to try remdesivir. And the Ministry of Health and Wellness has found yet another charge to bring against Dr. Manzanero in their kangaroo court. Dr. Manzanero was given 10 days to respond to these charges in writing. But I doubt anything he says in his own defense will even be considered by Minister Shabbat or his CEO. They want Manza gone and they are prepared to ruin him professionally if need be. Because I think this is much bigger than Dr. Manzanero versus the Minister of Health and Wellness. Government is about to cut the salaries of public workers and teachers by at least 10% and freeze all increments for three years. The unions weren't happy with the last government, and I don't think they feel particularly warm and fuzzy about this one either. The first four months of the Brasenio administration have been turbulent, and with an austerity budget that will most likely include the retrenchment of public employees, GOB could be sitting on a powder keg. So let any union leader or activist that might be looking to cause a spark take notice of how Dr. Manzanero is being handled. If they are willing to destroy the career of a man most Belizeans consider to be a hero, just what do you think they might do to you? We want to hear from you. You can find Brent's Two Cents on Twitter and Facebook at Two Cents Belize or email us at podcast at oshaproductions.com. That's O-X-A Productions with an S dot com. Well, the PUP might have their hands full with the unions in the months to come, but it looks like they won't have to worry about the UDP for at least another three years. On March 3rd, the People's United Party laid a municipal election beatdown on the United Democratic Party, the likes of which Belize has not seen since 2009. The UDP only managed to win two out of the 67 races contested last Wednesday, hanging on to the mayor's office in San Ignacio, Santa Elena, and winning one seat on the Twin Towns Council. That's it. The PUP won everything else, and now have a near-complete stranglehold on political power in Belize. Now, the results of the 2021 municipal elections were not unexpected, given the massive landslide victory the PUP enjoyed in the general election just 111 days earlier. By comparison, the UDP won the 2008 general election by nearly the same margin, and when municipal elections were held 13 months later, the PUP only managed to snag three town council seats in the blue stronghold of Orange Walk. The rest of the country went red in 2009. But I will leave it to the partisans to determine which party scored the biggest municipal election victory in Belize's modern era. What I want to talk about is what the results of the municipals mean for each party. Most people consider the municipal elections to be some sort of barometer for how the country is leaning politically, at least in those election cycles where there has been some time between the general and municipal elections. But personally, I see the municipal elections as an indication of how each party is doing in the 31 electoral divisions. Specifically, which standard bearers can mobilize the most support and bring out the votes for their party. 
If you think back to the 2018 municipal elections, the PUP winning Belize City was considered a bit of a surprise. Sure, people were already growing weary of the UDP nationally, but the Belize City Council under Mayor Daryl Bradley had performed fairly well for back-to-back terms. Now, Bradley decided not to run for a third term and was instead turning his attention to trying to get a standard bearer spot for the next general election. But most of his council offered themselves for re-election. On the PUP side, Bernard Wagner and his slate of council candidates were pretty much unknown. But what made the PUP's chances of winning the biggest prize in the municipal elections even less likely was that the big blue machine in 2018 was really just an assortment of parts that didn't fit together very well. Johnny Brisenio was two years into his second go-round as party leader, and things were not going well. The PUP were a deeply divided party. Remember, Brisenio was never the first choice of establishment PUPs. They preferred Francis Fonseca. On top of that, the Western Caucus of the party, led by Julius Espat, were clearly not behind Brisenio either. And then in Belize City, it began to look like Kareem Musa was going to make a play to take over the party that his dad once led, until he released a video just four and a half months prior to municipals saying he would not challenge Brisenio for leadership at this time. Now, reading between the lines, it looked to me like Musa was going to let Brisenio who had not been able to win anything as party leader to that point, lead the PUP into yet another defeat before making a move. But a funny thing happened on the way to the coup. The PUP pulled off a surprise victory in Belize City, thanks mostly to Cordell Hyde, who brought out huge numbers on Belize's south side, and also to Kareem Musa, who once again bested the UDP's Daryl Bradley. Now, I firmly believe that that night in March 2018 saved Johnny Brisenio's job, and he would not be the Prime Minister today without Cordell Hyde and Kareem Musa putting the PUP over the top in Belize City. Okay, you're probably wondering why I just spent so much time talking about 2018 when I'm supposed to be giving you my two cents on the 2021 municipal elections. Well, that's because, once again, the PUP won Belize City. And once again, Cordell Hyde was the biggest factor in that victory. Lake Independence voted overwhelmingly PUP. In fact, at one point on election night, Channel 7 was reporting that the PUP were winning by a 6 to 1 ratio in Belize's second largest electoral division. To put it simply, Cordell Hyde has established himself as a kingmaker. And while you might think that a near sweep of municipals coming on the heels of a landslide win in the general election would solidify Prime Minister Brisenio's leadership of the PUP, I'm not so sure it does. Winning will probably fix most things inside the PUP for a while. But How long until that party returns to the Game of Thrones mentality that we saw from 2009 through 2018? Especially now that it appears Cordell Hyde could seriously challenge for the Iron Throne at Independence Hall. Turning to the UDP, I think it's safe to say that John Saldiver's career in politics, at least as a candidate, is dead and buried. The man who led the UDP for all of 72 hours in 2020 was hoping that a UDP victory, or at least a close contest in Belmopan, would show that he could somehow still be relevant. But voters in the nation's capital rejected Saldivar's candidate Jacqueline Burns, and instead elected PUP's Sharon Palacio by nearly a 3-to-1 margin. The Blues now control Belmopan for the first time in 15 years. Elsewhere, Earl Trapp was popular enough to be elected mayor in San Ignacio, Santa Elena, despite the PUP controlling what used to be considered the Red Hills of Cayo. Hugo Pat did not appear to be much of a factor in Corozal, but in Belize City, the UDP did at least maintain their support in the traditional strongholds of Queen Square 
and Mesopotamia. So what does this now mean for UDP Patrick Faber? Well, on the bright side, he definitely won't have to worry about John Saldiver ever again. But will Faber be able to hold on to leadership with only four other UDP area reps, one mayor, and one town councillor elected since he became party leader? For now, I think so. For no other reason than who else is there to lead the UDP at this time? The only current member of the House of Representatives that I could see even having a remote chance of making a run for party leader would be Tracy Panton. Looking outside of Parliament, I have to wonder if it might soon be time for the UDP establishment to finally embrace Daryl Bradley. But running a political party takes money. Lots of money. And I don't think anyone is going to be opening their wallets for the UDP for at least a couple of years. So Patrick Faber might get the benefit of time to try and rebuild his party. I'm just not sure if time will be enough. Because the UDP is also going to need a lot of new candidates. Hugo Pat might be unelectable by the time the Commission of Inquiry is done digging into the goings-on at the Lands Department under his watch. And then there are the other 19 UDP candidates who hitched their star to John Saldiver's wagon and got rejected in November. So, the future leader of the UDP, whether it's Patrick Faber or not, could also depend on the caliber of candidates that they can recruit. It's not unlike the position the PUP found themselves in after 2008. I thought that party needed a full rebuild back then. But instead, they decided to wait it out through internal squabbles and a few leadership changes and finally some spiffy new graphics and in only 13 years, voila, they were back in power. Now, Patrick Faber is a young man who more than anything wants to one day be the Prime Minister of Belize. It seems unlikely that he'd be allowed to remain as leader of the opposition for three consecutive terms, but if the UDP are prepared to follow the PUP playbook and just wait it out for the pendulum to swing back their way, Faber will only be 57 in the year 2035. Okay, before I go, let me give shout-outs to the other Belizean podcasts that dropped new episodes in the past week. Dominique Norales just put out her own post-election episode of Velasaha. Paul Schmidt digs into COVID vaccines on the opinionated Cruffy. And then Natasha Stewart podcast has a great episode with Channel 7 reporter and anchor Sharice Halzel. I'll post links to all of these podcasts in the notes for this episode. And hey, speaking of Sharice, I want to give her a shout out for the great job she did anchoring Channel 7's daytime coverage of the municipal elections. It's hard to believe that Sharice has only been in broadcasting for a little more than a year and a half. Remember, you can be part of the podcast movement in Belize by sharing Brent's two cents with at least one person who otherwise may not know about it. And don't forget to subscribe to all the great Belizean podcasts on your favorite app so you never miss an episode from any of us. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Two Cents Belize. And I would especially love it if you would leave a voice message for the podcast about anything you want to talk about. You'll find the link to do that in the description for this episode. Hey, big thanks to Aria and Phil, aka my dad, for supporting this podcast and buying me some coffees. If you'd like to pitch in, you'll find a link for buy me a coffee in the notes for this show. A coffee only costs three US or six Belize, but it really helps to cover the costs associated with creating this labor of love that I produce for free. And that's going to do it for episode 28 of Brent's Two Cents. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, please continue to wear your masks wash your hands, stay home as much as possible, and most importantly, be nice to each other.
Brent's Two Cents is a presentation of OSHA Productions, Belize's affordable professional video production company.